Bruchma Boim, welcome to our home. Again, thank you very much for attending. Um, again, we're on a uh, tour of the Mishkan. This will be the sixth lecture. And um, so this week on my thoughts, I'd like to continue our virtual tour of the Mishkan with the beams and also the curtains that covered the Mishkan, the tabernacle. You know, Rashi stated in the beginning of chapter 26 in the portion of Truma, that the curtain that separated the holy from the holy of holies was woven with figures on both sides. On one side was the figure of a lion, and then on the other side was the figure of an eagle. Now, as Naim Latora states that this alludes to what we call the Kisei HaKavod, the throne of glory, which is fashioned with four faces, one on each side corner, pardon me, of the throne. On each one of the corners is an image on one corner is the image of a lion, the king of wild animals. On another is the image of an eagle, the king of birds. Then the image of man, the king of the world. And the last, an ox, the king of domestic animals. Now, both the figures of a lion and an eagle were both woven into the curtain. The kruvin, the childlike fist fit figures that rested and on the cover of the ark, were fashioned with the faces of man. However, the fourth image, that of an ox, was omitted, since it would have reminded God Almighty of the sin of the golden calf. He also stated that the words, Hayriot ha'echot, of each curtain, is repeated twice in the second verse of this chapter. This was to teach us that no other curtain was as holy as was this one. Uh, this was the curtain that always kept was kept over the ark and the poles whenever the nation would travel. In addition, this was the place where the incense was offered. It was also where the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, sprinkled the blood of his sacrifice when he ministered on the Yom Kippur. In Eturi Torah, it states that the beams on the inside of the Mishkan were all covered with gold. The curtains were ornate, made out of blue and purple thread, in fact, all the vessels were fashioned out of gold in addition to precious stones. However, the outside was covered with simple goat's hair. This is important because it teaches us that the beauty of a person's wealth should be, be, be displayed on the inside so as not to evoke envy, jealousy, and hatred from others. What we refer to as an ayin hara, an evil eye. The Torah tells us in, on 26.15 that the Kroshim, the beams used for the Mishkan were to be made out of Atze Shitim, cedar wood. Now the word Shitim is mentioned 24 times in this portion, which is an allusion to the 24,000 men who would die in the future because of the sins committed at Shitim with the Midianite women. The wood also uh, alludes to the um, Tzadikim, those righteous individuals who are compared to cedar trees, as the verse says in Psalm 92, 13, where it states, Sadiq katam or yifra, that the righteous will flourish like a cedar tree. The Orachayim stated that the ethical significance of the word crushing becomes evident if one transposes two letters of the word. Then the word would read kisharim, which means forming connections. By means of these beams, both the celestial forces and the terrestrial forces were able to unite. The beams needed to be 10 cubits high. Well, 10 is a complete number, which alludes to unity, a state which is essential when dealing with sanctity. In addition, the Torah required that the width of these boards should be one and a half cubits. This number is, not, is an allusion to the holiday of Pesach, uh, which we celebrate by eating both a whole matzah and a half piece of matzah. With the whole matzah, we make the blessing over bread, which symbolizes freedom. Then, whereas the, set, the half matzah, the one that we use for the blessing over the mitzvah of matzah, symbolizes slavery. The other half of the matzah we use as what we call the afikomen, which symbolizes hope and salvation. Altogether, there were 48 boards used in the construction of the Mishkan. Now, the number 48 alludes to the 48 prophets that would prophesy for the children of Israel throughout their history. In addition, there are 48 watches 
that were performed by the Kohanim and Levium in the temple. 48 is also the number of cities that were allotted to the Kohanim and Levium when they first entered the land of Canaan. 48 also connects to the 48 paths of wisdom. You know, in addition, it states in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, in chapter 6, that for one to acquire Torah, they must have 48 qualities mentioned in the Mishnah. In addition to the boards, there were also seven bars used in its construction. These bars allude to seven women who served as prophetesses. Seven is also an allusion to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, who was the seventh generation, beginning with Abraham, our, our father, Avram Avinu. There are different opinions about the number of bars that were used to hold up the Mishkan. There is one opinion that there were seven bars that held up the walls. Rashi, on the verse, states that there were two bars on the north wall and another two bars on the south wall of the Mishkan. In addition, he follows the opinion of the Bryce at the Malechus on Mishkan, which states that each wall has as having its own center bar that went through the walls. To then together, they would add equal seven. This verse in the portion of Truma, pardon me, the verse in portion of Truma states that you shall make bars of shittim wood, five for the beams on one side of the Mishkan. So the Talmud in uh, the tractate Shabbat, commenting on this verse says that the center bar worked miraculously, meaning that one single pole miraculously bent around the corners to pass through all three walls. In that case, there would have only been five bars on each side of the Mishkan. Yonas Ben Uziel question as to where did the children of Israel find the wood for the middle bar? The Talmud in Shabbat states that the middle bar was 110 feet long. The Talmud says that the angels cut down the Ashel tree that Avram Avinu, Abraham our father, had planted, and they floated it in the sea. When the children of Israel crossed the sea, they took it with them and used it in the construction of the Mishkan, miraculously. It encircled the whole of the Mishkan on all three sides. Now, based on the opinion that the center bar extended around all three sides, it helps us to understand as to why the nation somehow was able to put up the Mishkan, yet they were not able to keep it up. After all, there were 600,000 able-bodied men between the ages of 20 to 60, plenty of manpower. However, without the miraculous center bar, the walls of the Mishkan could not stand on their own. It was only in the merit of Moshe that this miracle occurred. Once he performed the miracle, it then continued to occur for all the 38 years in the desert. Now the number five connected to these five bars had a deeper meaning. The Zohar states that the five bars were meant to symbolize the five fingers on a person's hand. The middle bar was the longest of all the bars, alluding to a person's middle finger, the longest of all the fingers of one's hand. Now, in previous generations, young children would begin their study of the Chumash, the five books of Moses, with the third book of the Torah, the book of Leviticus. One would have to wonder why, especially since it is the most technical of all the five books of the Torah. It is referred to as Torah Kohanim, the book of the priests. Since much of this book deals with the sacrifices and instructs the Kohanim as to how they should perform their service in the temple. Our sages tell us that the reason why young children began their education of Torah with this book is that they are, as I've mentioned in a previous lecture, the guarantors of the Torah. When young children recite the words of the Torah, it is perceived by God Almighty as pure souls bringing pure sacrifices on the altar in the temple. As the verse states in Hosea, when the Shama forms the Fosen, we will render the prayer of our lips in the place of the oxen. So just as it was the middle bar that miraculously supported the Mishkan, so too it is the lips of young children reciting the words of the sacrifices which have supported our nation throughout our long exile. This may also connect to the advice given by the Rambam, Maimonides. He stated that a person should always choose the middle road in life, except 
when it comes to two traits, anger and ego. Then a person should always go to the extreme. One should never get angry, and they should always be humble. And I really think it's one. The reason why a person gets angry is because of ego. Me? You did that to me? I also believe that it is with the fingers of our hands that we do our work. The last word stated in the Torah that concluded the creation of this world was la sot, to do. In Hebrew, this word, it, world is referred to as olam ha the world of action. In fact, God commanded in his Torah that sheshesh yom and tavu, six days of the week you shall work. From this verse we learn that not only is keeping the Shabbat a mitzvah, but in addition working six days of the week is also a mitzvah. Now the number five is also an allusion to the five parts of the soul, what we call the nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, and yechidah. The Mishkan also served as a form of atonement for the sins of the nation. There are five expressions of anger that are connected with God Almighty. They are kahas, charon, av, chema, and ketzef. But does God really get angry? Does he possess human emotions? Our sages tell us that God's anger is expressed by him removing his presence from our midst and allowing nature to take its normal course. Verse 15 ends with the word omdim, standing up. The Hassam Sofer stated that these boards were omdim, which he translates as permanent. What he means by this definition is that all the raw material used in the construction of the Mishkan came from the rechush, from the wealth that they took from the Egyptians when they left Egypt. If they would have returned back to Egypt, they would have had to return all the wealth back to the original owners. However, the Shittim would belong to them, and it would have remained in their possession even had they returned to Egypt. The Elena Lashabayak stated that the word Omdim can also be tra translated as designated, that serving God Almighty should not be something that just happens. One should plan ahead and find better ways to serve God Almighty. That is also true in connection with the education of our children. It requires forethought. But Sadaka Cohen stated that different parts of the Mishkan represent different groups of Jews. The Kroshim, the boards, represent those individuals who have sinned. These boards are proof that even this group of sinners share in the destiny of the nation. Now, our sages tell us that in the end, with the coming of Mashiach, all sinners will do tshuva and become one with the children of Israel. Chapter 26 in the portion of Tshuva begins with the ten curtains that were woven to cover the Mishkan. Rashi states that these curtains were to be used for the roof and for the coverings of the outside boards. The Shemi Shmuel states that this portion is entirely devoted to a description of the various parts of the Mishkan. Verse 3 tells us, that there were ten panels of curtains that were coupled with hooks that joined them together. As the Balaturim states, that these ten curtains are an allusion to the Ten Commandments. The Orachayim said that the curtains were divided five and five, just like the two tablets, with five commandments inscribed on each one. The symbolism is crucial here. The Mishkan functioned as a constant reminder of the purpose of the whole system of worship. By the fact that the Torah states that there had to be two sets of five curtains linked together rather than just having all ten curtains sewn together, by doing so, the Torah kept the image of Matan Torah, of the giving of the Torah, with the giving of the two tablets vivid in the minds of the children of Israel. You know, similarly, we also read in verses 7 and 9 that there were an additional 11 panels of curtains that were laid over the original 10 curtains that covered the roof of the Mishkan. Once again, the five and the six curtains are not, were not all sewn together. Rather, they were connected with hooks. We may deduce from this fact that just as the lower layer of curtains symbolize the two luchot, the two tablets and their contents, so too the upper layer symbolized the whole Torah and how it is systematically divided. 
You know, the five curtains are an allusion to the five books of the written Torah. And the additional six curtains allude to the six orders of the oral Torah. Thus, the Mishkan had the Ten Commandments at its deepest layer, indicating that it is they which lie at the heart of the whole system of Jewish life. One layer above the written is the oral Torah, which is a direct consequence and outgrowth of the fundamentals expressed in the two Luchot. You know, the Mishkan, according to most opinions, was overlaid with four coverings, two that were woven from wool and linen, one from goat's hair, and the fourth made from animal hides. This physical world that we live in is also made up of four levels. They are domain, the inanimate represented by the earth, somea, plant life, vegetation connected to everything that grows, chai, animals, beings that have a life force, and medaber, mankind, one who speaks. Each level is connected to the one below it, all moving upward to God Almighty in all of his glory. The curtains were woven from a mixture of wool and linen. The Be'era Chumash questions as to why it was necessary to mix wool and linen together in the curtains of the Mishkan. After, according to Torah law, the mixture of wool and linen, which is referred to shotness, is prohibited. What is the reason that our sages tell us that shotness is forbidden? It goes back to the beginning of creation. The two sons of Adam, both brought sacrifices to God Almighty. Cain, Cain, who was a farmer, brought flax as an offering, but not the best quality. His brother Hevel, Abel, who was a shepherd, also brought a sacrifice, but he brought from the finest of his sheep. God accepted Hevel's offering, but not Cain's. Well, this created a rift between the two brothers, which eventually ended with Cain killing his brother Hevel. Based on the Medrash, we don't mix wool and linen together. However, in the temple, God's house, well, which was a place of total achtut, of unity and love, there was no reason to be concerned that hatred and division could exist. The Mizbeach HaNechoshet, the copper altar, is referred to with three names. In chapter 27 in the portion of Truma, it is called Mizbeach HaNechoshet, the copper altar. Although the altar was made from acacia wood, it was overlaid with copper. In the portion of Yisro, it is called the Mizbeach Adoma, the earthen altar. This name indicates that although the interior of the altar was hollow, they filled it with earth wherever they camped. Also in verse 38, the beginning of the chapter in the portion of Ayakel, it is referred to as Mizbeach, Mizbach, excuse me, Ha'ola, the sacrificial altar. This name indicates that the primary purpose of this altar was to offer sacrifices to God Almighty. Previously, in chapter 25, the Torah stated that God Almighty had shown Moshe a blueprint of both the Mishkan and all of its furnishings. This included the copper altar. When adding here that the altar was to be made with acacia wood, so the Torah is elaborating on the fact that although Moshe had been shown the picture of the completed altar when he was in heaven, what he saw was a completed altar made out of copper. It was now revealed to him that it was not made out of solid copper. Its base was acacia wood that was covered with copper. You know, there were three constant miracles that were associated with this copper altar. Although the fire burned on the altar day and night continuously, it did not burn through the copper plate, nor did it char the wood. Secondly, the altar stood in an open courtyard without a roof. Yet no matter how hard it rained, the fire on the altar was never extinguished. And third, the smoke that rose up from the altar always went straight up like a pillar. It made no difference how hard the wind blew. The Hebrew word Mizbeach, altar, is spelled Mem, Zion, Bet, and Chet. These four letters are an acronym. Mem for Mechilo, forgiveness. Zion for Sukhut, merit. Bet for Beracha, blessing. And Chet for Chaim, life. So that all blessings could be gained through the sacrifices that were offered on the altar. That was the reason given as to why no iron utensils were allowed to touch it. 
The altar was seen as a means to attain life, whereas iron is seen as a metal that brings about death. The Aksavya Kabbalah stated that the verse in the portion of Truma, the beginning of the um, t- chapter 27, tells us the dimensions of the altar. It says there it was to be five cubits long and five cubits wide. By the verse stating that it should be rochev revua yia, meaning that the altar must be square, the Torah is telling us that these exact measurements of the altar were not mandatory for all times. However, the fact that it was square, well, that was mandatory. The Talmud in Zvachim states that the altar could be any size as long as it was square. The question becomes, why was it necessary for the altar to be square? The Zohar says that a cube alludes to God's ineffable name of mercy, and what we refer to as the Yudke Vavke. The gematria, the numerical value of this name, is 26. A cube is made up of six sides, 12 lines, and eight points. Six plus 12 plus eight equals 26, an allusion to God Almighty. So rather than steps leading up to the copper altar, there was a ramp. The Torah states at the end of the portion of Yitro that you shall, go, you shall not go up by steps onto my altar so that your nakedness should not be uncovered. Imagine, if God Almighty is so concerned about the honor and the dignity of something that is inanimate, something that has no thoughts or feelings, then one can only imagine how much more so does he care about the honor and dignity of a human being whom he created in his own image. The fact that the outside sacrificial altar was made from copper was not an accident. As Rashi states on the verse in 27.2 that the copper was used to atone for insolence and a brazen brow. This may also be why the altar was filled with earth. Nothing Nothing in the world is as humble as is the earth. It allows everyone to tread upon it, and it never complains. What we refer to as derech eretz, the way of the earth. The Haksav, the Akabala, stated the Torah commanded in the portion of Truma that there should be a reshet, a brass netting that encircled the copper altar. Now, initially, the Torah called the netting michbar, and now it calls it reshet. Why? The word reshet alludes to the Hebrew word reshut, meaning domain, like reshut harabim, a public domain. The purpose of the netting was to separate between what was above and what was below it, as it pertained to the sprinkling of the blood of the animals that were sacrificed on the altar. In addition, there were four cubes. The Torah refers though to them as karanot, horns. They were placed on each of the four corners of the altar. As part of the temple service, the Kohen would apply blood from a sacrifice on them. I think we will end our virtual tour here, and hopefully continue next week with the copper labor and the outside beams of the courtyard. Again, I hope you're finding all of this information and symbolism interesting and also instructional. Let us end with the prayer for an end to the war in Gaza, with the safe release of all the hostages, and the speedy and complete recovery of all of those who have been injured. May God Almighty comfort all of those who have lost loved ones, and may he protect all the brave IDF soldiers and civilians who are in harm's way with the coming of Sheikh Zakeno quickly and in our time. Now, again, let me thank you for attending. Again, God should bless you all with happiness and health and safety, all that is good. Um, Again, if you can, if you haven't, please subscribe push like, and if you share with your friends, that would be appreciated. Um, again, let me uh, say that there will be a uh, original song done after this lecture. Please stay tuned. Again, thank you very much for attending. God bless. Be well. Shabbat Shalom.